Well, uh, let's see. What day is it? I'm not even entirely sure. Thursday, I think. Um, still working on the frame. This is the rear part of the frame. You can see my slightly dodgy setup here. Um, the frame's very strong. Uh, it's also quite light. I haven't weighed this one yet. But when I finish putting the rest of the timbers in it, I'll, I'll weigh it. See what it comes out as. But I've just been cleaning up these corner pieces. Uh, you can see on, on the top one there how I just glued extra blocks on. That should be easily strong enough. And then I use the the plane, it shouldn't really be sitting on its side like that, but uh, use the plane to, to flatten all this off. It's quite nice planing this, this ash, it, uh, it works really well, especially if all the blades and things are sharp. So that's tidied up that, and since I've got it mounted this way up, I was able to trim off this side, these angles. I still need to do the top ones. So I'll have to see how I can set it up. Uh, my little bench here, it's not very sturdy at all. Um, it's only really a light duty sort of thing. So having a, a big piece like this in there, it's pretty flimsy. But um, that's okay. It, it kind of works. The bottom did fall out of it, so I have to clean up all of that mess. So I'm going to flip this over now and trim the other sides. I find... The, um, the little Japanese pull saw works really well for chopping these off. I do just need to sand that. There's a little bit of a, a lip on there. Um, I'll just sand those flat with a block. So I'm going to flip this over and then I'll start. Uh, then I'll clean up the other side and then I can look at this rail here. So what I've done is my usual trick, which was... I printed out half of my plan and then I cut the bits of paper out and stick them together and then that's glued onto a piece of cardboard and I'm going to trim this and I'll use this as my pattern when I go to cut the timber because it's easier to adjust the cardboard than uh, adjust the timber. The one difficulty is when I print it out, you print it out as a PDF and you, you print it as a multi-part PDF and then you have to stick all the pieces together and it can be a bit of a jigsaw at times and for this one I actually had to go back in inside to the computer and have a look at the printout to figure out where it had split the pages to know what order to actually um, put them back together but you can see these these squares mark where those um, the tops of those curved pieces are so today's progress uh, getting a little tired of doing some of this actually I think I might need a break not tired um, just I've been working hard at it for the last few days pretty much full-on and I think I was getting to the point where I was starting to make mistakes and I think I just need to take a break and do something else but I wanted to get it so the frame is mostly done and I actually discovered that I have gone wonky uh, that half inch that I was out did come back to bite me but luckily, because I've made everything so much oversized, so much bigger than the original ones, because I knew I was going to have to be shaving it all down, I've got plenty of material there to actually recover. So where I've gone wrong is these pieces here. Um, you can see this is where it actually needs to be. So I need to trim quite a lot more than I expected um, from there. That back one's okay. And then again on this side, you can see I need to sort of trim both of these. Uh, now there is plenty of material there, and the, the reason that's happened is these ended up not being vertical, those inside faces. Um, even though I made sure everything was when I sort of screwed it all together and glued it together, after everything had dried and set, it seems like it had moved. And I think that's, I don't know if that's just the nature of timber or I don't know the right way to do things or when I screwed it together it all twisted just slightly. But um, they ended up not vertical. What I've ended up doing to, to sort of fix that is I've actually glued shims on the edges here 
Um, it was easy enough to figure out what shape they needed to be. And you can see I've, I'm also gluing some in across the top. That's why I've got clamps there. And the only reason I had to do that was you need this face all the way along there to be flat because there's a steel bracket that uh, sort of one eighth thick steel, three mil, uh, that gets screwed all the way around there. Uh, there are, another thing I ha actually have to do, which I keep forgetting, is I need to make the hoop that goes over the axle. That's sort of the, the limit to limit the upper travel. I just need to know exactly what sort of height that is. Um, I think it's about an inch less than the opening, so it, it's about three inches above the axle, I believe. And I still haven't done the finishing off the tail. I need to make the, the end piece there. Um, there'll be a vertical piece here. And then this is the, uh, the front of the boot opening. So this here is the boot opening. And every time I add a piece to this car, it seems to get smaller, which kind of makes sense. I guess the volume it takes up is, it, it, I'm filling up the space. Um, and you start realizing how tight these things are and how little room there is for everything. So this is still accurate to my CAD model, more or less. Um, I just trimmed it fat and just trimmed the cardboard. So what I will do is I will um, cut this out of timber like I normally do, and I just have to, it extends forwards. This is where I have to be really careful about all my angles because this rail is dropping down and this is on this face. When I extend it that way, I need to trim the bottom up on an angle, if that makes sense. Um, getting the angles correct on this piece was really hard, trying to get both ends to fit. And I actually ended up using epoxy on those joints because I did have a little bit of a gap. I couldn't get them to pull really tightly together. So those joints are epoxy. Um, the thing is with these frames, unlike a modern car, the frame has to move, it has to flex because the chassis is so flexible. Uh, the, I suspect the stiffest thing on it is going to be the aluminium and the, the frame is basically only there to provide the edges for the aluminium to wrap around. Um, I know somebody commented on my, one of my films that, you know, it's, it needs to support the aluminium, but I don't believe that is actually the case because the aluminium I'm using is 1.6 mil thick. And this was kind of a door skin mock-up I did. And you can see this has got quite a bit of shape in it. And if you lay it down, it's pretty stiff. Um, the only reason it's moving here is because the edges are, aren't constrained. But you, you can't really, if this has got shape to it, you, you won't be able to press that in. Um, that'll be rigid. And of course, this is the, a barrel-shaped body, so it has a lot, of, oops, a lot of shape to it. Um, I think others have commented from the film, it looks like there's too much curve there. But in person, it, it, it is correct. Um, I've checked it and I've rechecked it multiple times. Of course, it depends what you're using as your model. Um, and I've sort of had to average out various bodies and things. I don't have a real body I could actually go and measure and compare against. Uh, it would be interesting one day to actually park it next to a real one and see how close it is. But uh, that's probably very unlikely to ever happen, so it probably doesn't matter. But... Uh, what else do I need to do? Oh, I still need to make the uh, the door shut pillar. So there's actually blocks that come in here and that's curved. Uh, it curves, comes up and curves around. So that fills in that little piece and that's where the, the door striker goes in there. But, uh, that stick across the top that was for me to check that I have the, the line correct. Uh, it's actually a little bit off because I need to shave down this edge, which is why it's sort of the tail here is a little bit high, but it kind of gives you an idea how little shape there is in the top. It's fairly flat across there. 
uh, the boot lid is almost flat as well which is correct obviously it rolls side to side but um, I think that's starting to look definitely starting to get an idea of the shape uh, there's going to be an awful lot of sort of shaving down of the timber to get all the lines correct and I have run out of timber for making the door I think I'll have just enough to finish the body but uh, to help shave things down I did just recently pick this up I've got this on trade me uh, it's a 151 spoke shave I just sharpened it up I just notice it's a bit crooked it's an adjustable one I have got another one which is not adjustable but uh, this one these ones are much easier to use so uh, that should be really handy I've just realized all my masking tape that's meant to hold that uh, temporary cardboard firewall in place is coming off I'm just looking at making the hoop that goes across there the front of the boot opening um, I mentioned how from my CAD model I get the I get cross sections basically a, a plane and this particular one is on this edge the right hand side so when I make it into a 3d piece I have to allow for the fact that this is the smaller side of that piece of timber so if you imagine you can you can see it on here I haven't shaped this yet so I need to taper this down because my cross section is on this side when I cut it out I actually need to make it bigger so I need to make it a little bit bigger on this face so that I've got material there to take off to come down to this line um, and you can sort of approximate how much that needs to be it varies because the curvature is varying but you can get some idea I put a straight edge across there and I put another one across there and I can measure up and I can see how much of this stick drops and it's about an eighth of an inch it's almost flat there so it doesn't really matter so this is my cardboard template um, oh, so I went from CAD to CAD but to get that extra thickness I can trace around this and then this is a trick I've used with my metal working if I want to extend out a line you can just run a line of masking tape because it's a very uniform width this happens to be six mils so close enough to quarter of an inch and then I can trace along the outside line of that tape and that makes it that much fatter in an even way um, that's quite a good trick and I'm sort of trying to use up my little scraps and bits and pieces so I should be able to get um, the two halves of this this hoop out of here uh, just so I can try and get the grain running in a suitable direction it's another day another really nice sunny day actually still nice and sunny and I'm working on the frame some more I have added in the the hoop there uh, that's the front of the boot opening and I've actually started uh, fairing everything in smoothing it all in so I've been using the spoke shave uh, that works reasonably well uh, but I find the easiest way is just with the bell grinder with a 60 grip um, belt on it and I can take away a lot of material quite quickly so I have fixed up the sides I had to take quite a bit off there but it all still lines up quite nicely now um, this is just done roughly at the moment so it's not perfect yet but you start seeing now why I made all of these pieces slightly oversized because you're starting to now see the angles on them that need to be there to follow the curve of the body so this is the, the tail and I've also been sanding the front and finally getting this front edge fared in this is where the firewall will screw onto um, 
this it's quite a complex shape here because there's more shape at the bottom than there is at the top the top's almost flat just a little bit of an angle but as it comes around it curves in more uh, so the way I did that was I just eyeballed it basically and I used my trick with the tape to lay a tape line around here to give me a nice curve and then traced around it with a pencil and just more or less did it by eye and then somewhere around here I think I've dropped it it's lying on the ground there is my steel rule and I was just using that to check the curve is fair but again this is just rough at the moment I can't do it fully until everything's on the car and I can do a line all the way down the side of the car but I'm getting pretty close to that now um, I also tidied off some of these corners where bits were sticking out I just sort of smoothed all of that in um, same on the tail so I think I'm almost at the stage where I should put this back on the body um, I have realized I've done I've made one mistake uh, actually I've made lots of mistakes but I've recovered from all of them but there's one mistake I still need to address which is this seat back um, I actually forgot to increase the width of it so this back edge is correct but this front edge is now too short so it may not actually be a problem it might be possible to to wrap the aluminium around that because the aluminium gets wrapped around that edge anyway um, it just wouldn't be tight right up on that corner which makes it difficult to hammer it around so I may, may end up having to, to glue a sort of thin strip all the way around here just to build this up and we're only talking about maybe an eighth of an inch three sixteenths something like that uh, to get the shape of this correct again I'm going to put it back on the chassis and I'll lay some paper over it to start getting an idea of how this all sort of fits together but it's getting there uh, the other thing I still need to do is again it's only rough at the moment because I haven't finished the tail so I'm going to put the the rear on there and then there will be a another piece of timber that goes from the top down to the tail I think that's probably all I need I don't think I need side pieces there because there's so much shape in there that tail will be pretty pretty solid um, there may actually also need to be another piece that goes in here I think I have to go check on the originals a lot of these details get really hard to see um, luckily I have some photos of original bodies that are off cars but even then it gets quite hard to see without with the skin on exactly what's happening but I, I do have some reference photos um, and a lot of the other photos I've got show differences anyway so it's, it's just a bit hard um, hopefully the body is flexible enough that's kind of where it gets a bit weird with a vintage car compared to a modern car especially modern race cars where they're trying to make everything as stiff as possible this is almost the opposite it has to be flexible because the chassis is so flexible the whole car moves um, which is one of the reasons they're, they're quite fun to drive because it, it's it feels way more alive than a, a modern car which feels a bit dead um, whereas the vintage car everything's moving around and rattling and, and following the road so hopefully there'll be enough flex in the body but by the time I've thinned everything out to make the shape correct it'll be a lot thinner so it should be a little bit more flexible um, so you don't need to make it too rigid I guess uh, this place is a mess now there's sawdust everywhere I'm covered in it um, clouds of dust are coming off me so I think what I may do is vacuum everything up and then I'll use the air compressor to just blast as much of the sawdust out as I can and you can see it it's all over the place so it's definitely coming along um, if I do need to glue a strip on there I'm not sure the best way to do that I'll have to have a think about that um, but 
it's looking pretty good. Oh, I still need to make the little corner blocks as well, the, the rear of the door blocks, but I need to put it back on the chassis to be able to do that. I think I'm at a good point to stop for the afternoon. Now I've put the, the frames back on the chassis and I've added in the timber across the top there and I've started making the tail, um, the, the block that becomes the, the tail, which is this, just a couple of pieces glued together that'll all be shaped. Um, cut on the right angle so that the tail is it's not perfectly vertical it's actually tipped in just a fraction uh, just so that it looks vertical if that makes sense um, I think if you have it directly straight up and down and you get it wrong it'll look very wrong if it tips backwards so I'm just having it slightly in very very slightly um, less severe than on the Austin but you can see with the rough shaping done how it's starting to look like a car now. Um, can you get some idea of the shape and how it all sort of lines up? And you get a good idea of the barrel shape. Um, a few people have commented that it looks too curved and I'm just wondering if that's something to do with the the actual camera angle because it is correct. I've I've checked and double checked and rechecked it. It is a very curvy body. So it is it is pretty curved and it starts straightening off to the tail, but there is still some shape there. If we look at it from the front. From the front, you start getting a good idea of the the shape of it. So, it's quite narrow. Uh, I measured it, it's actually, I think it's fractionally narrow, narrower than my Austin 7. Um, just a little bit. But uh, I think it looks right. I've been playing with my, my sticks as well and running those along it and it is all pretty fair curves. A um, little bit of tweaking here and there. So, oh, I still haven't done the bits at the end there. And I may have enough timber left down there. It's sort of half a, half a plank and another little piece. There might be enough there to actually make the doors. So I need to start looking at, uh, at doing that, I guess. Another idea of the shape. There's too much going on in here. I don't think you can really see it. You should probably eventually wheel it outside and have a look at it. But I'm pleased with how it's looking. I like the way the tail comes up, um, follows the sweep of the the chassis rails there. The I think the body is the right sort of height. I did sit in the car with a piece of board where the seat goes, basically. Um, just to check that, that you do sit in the car and you really do sit in the car. Uh, so one problem with Austin 7 Specials you see quite often is um, people make them so low they end up looking like they're sitting on the car, not in the car. And if it's a very small car that just looks silly. Uh, they, they end up looking like knotty cars. So this one you're definitely in low, you've got the wheel right in your face, um, which is the, the correct period sort of driving position. That's basically how they were. Uh, this Now you can see exactly how big the, the boot opening is. I mean, it's not huge. It's what, a couple of hand spans wide. Uh, the fuel tank has to go in here. So basically this is mostly fuel tank, um, which is interesting because then it means you've got if you've got a big fuel tank there, you've got a lot of wasted space in the tail here. Um, which is probably a good thing, you don't want to fill it up with too much weight, I guess. But, uh, looks good. Uh, you can see I've got all my other cars outside. So I had to have a really good clean up because there was sawdust absolutely everywhere. 
Uh, I use the compressed air, um, which is very effective at basically lifting all the dust up and then letting it fall down on top of everything again, just in a much more even coating. So that's good. Uh, I did manage to sort of blow maybe 10% of it out the door. Um, but then I, I took the other cars outside and um, gave them a bit of a, uh, a clean off as well. So Austin and then the Land Rover and the little MG. Um, you'll notice I've got pieces of cardboard underneath all of these cars. Uh, yes, they do all drip oil, but they're all British. So that's how you know they're still alive. When they stop dripping oil, you know they've, they've run out. Um, I was wondering if that's enough cars now that I can say I have a fleet. I, I notice that's a thing on YouTube. People have fleets of cars. So I've got four. They all run. Oh, and a motorbike. So does that count as my fleet? Um, speaking of YouTube, I'm also playing around with trying to minimize the number of ads in the video. So I have some control over what goes in there. I just never really bothered uh, to fiddle with the settings before. And I am still can't be bothered to fiddle with the settings, so I'm just trying to turn them all off. I think YouTube still automatically runs ads in certain things. Um, but we'll see. I'll see if I can get, get rid of them. Uh, the other thing with this is the tail. Um, I'm not sure if I will have little pieces on the side of the tail there. There'll definitely be one along the top. But uh, it really isn't necessary. Because the tail has so much shape. And we can see this on the Austin. That's why I have the um, boot lid off. I don't know if we can see it in the light, but that's the fuel tank in the Austin. But you can see the Austin's a... Ow! It's hot. It's been sitting in the sun, so everything's been cooked. Um, but you can see the, the aluminium doesn't touch the steel tube. It doesn't touch the frame. Oops. Uh, even right at the back, it, it doesn't actually touch. It's, it's sitting off the frame, and it's more than strong enough. I mean, it's 1.6 mil aluminium, it's pretty thick. Uh, on, the, on the Riley, the edges will be constrained. That's what the timber's for. So with the edges constrained, this has got a wide edge. Um, I mean, this is pretty solid. I don't think it's going to, to have any problems. Just notice my number plate lamp is going rusty there. So, I think the, the tail will be fine. It's a very similar shape to that tail. So I think now I can put all of the cars away. Um, I need to wait for that tail block to dry. And I'll start piecing through my, all my offcuts to see if I've got the bits to make the, the door locks. Um, I'm trying a different way of extracting the dust from this. I'll put a little vent in the middle here and it sort of works uh, it's just a whoops a magnet holding it in place but there's there's so many places where it leaks um, but it does seem to, to suck the sawdust that comes under like down the blade gets sucked up but it's just a messy business this woodworking there's dust everywhere uh, but I've still got lots of little offcuts. There's plenty of offcuts there that I can make those those door pieces from. Same in here. All sorts of little bits and pieces left over. But yeah, I think that's a good place to stop for now. Um, as I keep saying, I've been working on this for days. I think I just need a break. I need to go and do something else for a while just to uh, to change it up a bit. One last quick thing. I've never actually looked at how much having a body like this made would cost. Um, I'm not even sure who you would go to in New Zealand 
to get something like this done. There may be people around who do it. Um, I suspect the main place would be auto restorations down in Christchurch, but I, I haven't talked to them. I don't know how much they would charge to do something like this. It would be interesting to find out. But a friend of mine sent me a copy of a Facebook post. Uh, I'm not on Facebook, so I can't log in and see it, but luckily he, he, he knows that, so he took um, pictures of it for me. And that was someone who coach builds Bentley bodies by the looks of it. Uh, must do other things as well, I'm assuming. But they had some actual prices there. And for a four and a half litre Bentley frame, and this is just the ash frame, was £12,000 in labour cost and £2,000 for materials. Uh, and that was the ash and glue, uh, hinges, door locks, things like that. Um, the post was a bit confusing because there was another body style there and that was, uh, I think it was a boat tail body and that was £15,000 labour. Uh, so I thought I'd add up what I've actually spent on mine, not counting my labour of course because I don't pay myself. Um, I'm assuming if you're paying someone to do it, you're going to get a top-end professional job rather than my sort of amateur efforts as I'm sort of making it up as I go along. But the material costs I can actually work out because I keep track of all of this. So the ash, I had to guess. I didn't know how much ash I'd need. Um, since most people are in the UK, uh, New Zealand dollar is about half uh, the British pound. So... Whenever you see a New Zealand dollar amount, double it. That's pretty much close enough. No idea what that relates to in terms of US dollars. I'm sorry. Um, I don't even know what the exchange rate is to the US dollar. But ash, I got uh, 15, 17 meters of ash. There were two different sizes and I had to get it machined because it was rough sawn. But that came to 774 New Zealand dollars. I bought a couple of sheets of plywood because I'm going to use one for the seat back and one for the firewall. Uh, the steel is for a uh, steel strap basically to make all the different little brackets and things. Uh, the glue was $70, that's that Type 1-3. I've used a bit of epoxy as well but I already had that. And the screws, I haven't used all the screws but I had to buy a selection. Um, stainless steel screws was $172. So the actual material costs was $13.66 in New Zealand dollars. And I do still need to buy things like the door locks and strikers, uh, the hinges for the doors and budget lock or two budget locks, uh, a key and the little covers and things, which is what locks the boot lid in place. I'll need to get those from the UK. Uh, these prices are without VAT because I don't have to pay that. But usually what happens is the amount you pay for shipping, it ends up being similar to paying full price. So adding up all the materials I think I need, that was £551, so $1,100 New Zealand dollars, plus shipping on top of that, whatever that's going to be. So my total cost, I think, is about £1,233. So it's kind of comparable. I'm imagining a Bentley body has quite a bit more timber in it. Um, looking at the pictures, it looked a lot more substantial. So I guess it's kind of comparable. Um, the interesting thing is the, the labor, what somebody would, would charge hourly to do something like this. Um, I, I have no idea. There aren't so many people around who can do it, so they get to charge what they want, I guess. But that's kind of the body costs. Um, those costs are just the frame. So that's not including the aluminium for the skin or all the time and all the effort to actually make the skin as well. So, you know, by the sounds of it, if you were building a four and a half litre Bentley body, um, you know, if it's, if you're talking sort of 20,000 pound just for the frame and the materials um, and then you have to add the skin on top of that and somebody to make all of that uh, that's a lot of work as well weld it all together then you have to trim the whole thing um, you can see why these cars are expensive and this is 
the Riley isn't really even an expensive car. It's kind of a cheap car. It's the, the lower end of the scale. So it's nowhere near as expensive as, say, a, um, a Bugatti or a Rolls-Royce or, or, um, or a Bentley. So it's interesting just comparing the costs. I do have a spreadsheet for the total costs on the car so far. Uh, and I think it's up to, I think, I think I'm still just under 50,000 New Zealand dollars. So about 25,000 pound. Um, that gives you some idea of the cost of this monetary cost. Time, of course, uh, it's lots and lots of time. But I consider it, because it's my hobby, it's entertainment. So it's probably cheaper than going to the movies or playing golf or something like that. So just thought they were, it was interesting seeing some of the numbers. Just putting the dust cloth over the car, um, ready to pack up for the afternoon. And I realized I haven't messed up this front rail um, because looking at it, you can see I have left extra there um, to sand that down. So I don't end up having to glue anything to the front of that. Um, I did do it the right way around, which is good because that would have been a real pain in the neck. <laughs> 